92 years of competition, 130 million people, and not one individual gold medal till the man on my left hit the Holy Grail with a 10.7 at 7.30, 7.45 a.m. in the morning on the 8th of August 2008 at the Beijing Olympic Games. Abhinav Bindra for ex forever will be the biggest sporting icon that this country has ever produced because that achievement of the first ever individual gold medal winner will never be taken away from him. Thank you, Abhinav, for joining me. And the other gentleman, 16 test matches wins on the trot. The World Cup win, perhaps leading the greatest team of all time, giving us the whole cult of the baggy green that we have now come to celebrate. Somebody who has perhaps had the most perfect cricketing career of all, someone who's respected the world over, Australian former captain, one of the greatest legends of all time, Steve Waugh. Steve, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Royal Stag, Barrel Select, Perfect Strokes could not have given us two better gentlemen to talk about perfection in sport. Abhinav, I've asked you this 200 times. I need to ask you one more time. 4.2 in the sight shot in Beijing. The whole memory of Athens coming back, making an Olympic record, making the final coming seventh, and then you have, what, minutes to get ready for that final 10 shots of your life, which can be make or break. Tell me your mindset. Well, obviously, the, the start of the final in Beijing was a little bit of a shock. Um, but, you know, you, you put it aside and uh, you try and do your best and, you know, you don't give up ever. You fight and you fight and you fight. I mean, um, the only thing you can't do is give up. And that's what I was just trying to do was to fight, try and find a solution, try and find a way out of it. And uh, that's what I tried to do. I was just immersed in the process of shooting. I was immersed in the moment. Um, I was, I didn't really care about the outcome at that, at that stage when I was in Beijing. I had a great sense of detachment from the outcome and that's why I probably won. Um, I was just focused on my task. I was trying to, that, that uh, challenge came my way, I tried to solve it and luckily for me I was able to solve it and I'm sure I was able to solve it only because I was immersed in the moment. If I was overwhelmed by the outcome or the possible outcome at that stage, I'm sure my mind would have not had that uh, attentional awareness to, 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 get, to get back on task and to try and find a solution to that challenge that I was posed with. If I can sort of think from memory my Steve was Abhinav Bindra moment, <laughs> it has to be the 1999 World Cup South Africa game, Australia down and out, suddenly you come from nowhere, that Herschel Gibbs freakish thing happens, you get a hundred, then that semi-final. Talk us through those emotions and that challenge. I'm not sure it was uh, as uh, pressure cooked as up enough, uh, you know, an Olympic uh, every four years. I mean, that to me is the ultimate in sport. I love the Olympics purely because I, I the theatre and the, uh, um, you know, the, the great stories against the odds and uh, how people overcome different things. So I guess, yeah, 1999 World Cup, it comes every four years, but we have other things in cricket. So it's, um, you know, we have... Um, things that we can sort of achieve in between those four years. But yes, the World Cup in 1999, against the odds we needed to win seven games in a row to win the World Cup. And the pressure was certainly on, but for us it gave us a clear focus because we had no other choice. We had to play well, we had to concentrate. We had to not look too far ahead because we had to take each game as it came along. We couldn't sort of say, you know, we couldn't look too far ahead. I think at the start of the World Cup, we were so focused on winning the World Cup because we were favourites that we took our eye off the ball and we didn't look at the process needed to get there. And once we realise we're looking too far ahead, then we started playing good cricket. Abhinav, is winning an Olympic medal the perfect moment for an international athlete, say a shooter? Of course, that's the highlight. That's the pinnacle of uh, my sport. And uh, that is the biggest thing that is there in my sport, followed by the World Championships. And uh, yes, you know, we, we, for, for all my life, that was my dream. I woke up every morning with that one goal and one dream to, to win a gold medal at the Olympic Games. That was my biggest uh, driving force and uh, my biggest motivation. Um, that was my dream. I dreamt of it. I, I trained the whole day. I trained for years and years and years. And that, was just, that, that for me was the ultimate thing because the Olympics are a very, very special event. Uh, um, and it, it meant the world to me. Steve, when you lead a team with so many superstars like you did, Shane Warne, Matthew Hayden, X, Y. Everybody is a superstar in his or her own right. Some may be even more talented than you are. Possible. How do you deal with such people and forge them into a team and make it into a team that wins 16 matches and World Cups, etc., etc.? 
Yeah, look, that's a challenge of having a really good side, um, keeping everyone happy and uh, and satisfied with uh, the opportunities they're getting, particularly bowlers. If you've got four really talented bowlers, they all want to take five wickets. That's obviously not possible. So, And batsmen, they all want to score hundreds. I think at the end of the day, you've just got to get that common goal. As a team, we wanted to be the best team in the world, not in, only in test cricket, but in one-day cricket. We wanted to... Uh, be good role models off the field as well. We want to represent our country the right way. Um, so it was all about, I think, the senior players on the side, not only the captain getting that message across, but having trusted lieutenants in my side, not only my vice captain, but other senior players who were the eyes and ears of what was happening that I didn't know because sometimes as a captain, you don't get all the information or players won't tell you everything. So you need other players on the side to keep it on an even keel level and make sure no one's getting out of control. So at the end of the day, You've got to have loyalty to your own game, but you've got to be loyal to the side and what you're trying to achieve. And, uh, you know, you want individual flair from the players to come out. Um, but at the same time, you've got to always remember that um, the team goals come first. Does the loyalty end at the end of your career? Because I'm seeing people write in their autobiographies about dressing room secrets. you agree with that? Yeah, look, I, I'm disappointed with some of the things that are being said recently. Um, Look, I guess that's the way of the modern world. Um, you know, most players write a book afterwards. I've, I've written 13 books myself. Um, I try, I guess, to, uh, if I'm going to criticise someone, generally in my books I criticise myself more than other people because you, you have a look and you can say things you probably couldn't say when you are playing. But, um, yeah, I, I don't like some of the things that have come out recently that have, uh, I guess, um, disrespected the legacy we had as a great side. I know when I captained my team we had a very content side enjoyed each other's company, enjoyed each other's success and want to hear one or two players sort of doubting that or saying different things and you know, I'm disappointed because that, that wasn't the case. I, mean, I've, I think one difference between Steve and you is if there is any country which has a perfect sporting system or close to a system is Australia and if there's any country which has no sporting system and you sort of champions come out as individuals rather than a product of a system is India. S sort of becoming a champion athlete without a system in place. Talk me through that journey. You know, there's a lot of talk um, that Indian athletes sometimes are not mentally strong. I believe the, in the opposite. I feel because of the challenges that Indian athletes have to go through, they're actually very mentally, they're mentally very sound and very, very strong because they, they face challenges on a daily basis to get just the basics done. Uh, and that makes them stronger. They don't give up. They fight through it. They find a way. There's a tremendous amount of will they possess. Um, where we lack is a, uh, any sort of foundation, a, a very poor technical foundation uh, at the grassroots level. Uh, and then, you know, when you're at a very pressure situation, your weakest link, link comes to the fore. And if you're technically way weak, if your basics are not quite there, then it's difficult to get through, uh, through challenging situations. But uh, mentally, we're not bad. I think it's, it's a misconception that you know, Indian athletes are mentally weak. This is because of a lack of a system and, and the immense challenges that athletes have to overcome um, makes them strong. Steve, 1987, unfancied Australian team comes to India for the Reliance Cup, beating Pakistan in the semi-final, coming to our home city, Kolkata, Steve Waugh becomes a legend in India. Talk me through that journey and that legendary association with the city and you being a cult still remains. Yeah, you're right. We were total underdogs coming into that uh, 87 World Cup. In fact, in Australia, we'd lost everything the previous year. We lost the Ashes. Uh, there was an America's Cup one-day tournament. We lost that. Then we also lost a one-day series to England. So we're c coming off pretty bad form. And um, but we were lucky enough to have Alan Border as a captain who was very resilient and tough and determined and a fantastic coach in Bob Simpson. And we got to India and we trained harder than any other side. I, I, remember, I remember training in um, Madras or Chennai as it is now and it was 40 degree heat. And we were out there just doing fielding practice for like two, three hours in a row. And I remember journalists and other teams looking at us and thinking, these guys are crazy. They're, gonna, they're, gonna blow, you know, they're not going to be right for the, for the World Cup. They're going to expend too much energy. But what we were doing was, I guess, accumulating mental toughness because we were doing stuff in difficult circumstances where no one was really watching and just getting, getting ready for the battle ahead. And uh, once we won the first game in Chennai and Madras back there, I think I was lucky enough to bowl the last over and Meninder Singh had a wild slog and lost his stumps. From that moment on, we had the self-belief that we could achieve anything. So that win against India was just such a great um, confidence boost for a young side that all of a sudden we got on a roll and we got to Eden Gardens, which is still one of the highlights of my, my career, playing in, in front of 100 or 120,000. I'm not sure what the numbers were because... There were so many people in, the, in that ground and, and we were fortunate enough that we'd beaten um, you know, Pakistan in the semi-final and our adversary, England, had beaten India. So all of a sudden, 
We all supported him. There was 100,000 Indians cheering for Australia, which was a, a really weird sensation to come to a country and play in front of a crowd that was cheering for us. And uh, we were young and inexperienced, and England were still probably the favourites, had a lot of experienced players. Um, but we just, we, we felt something special in that team. We had that X factor. I don't know what it was, but you know when it's in a side that you can pull through the tough situations. We're enjoying each other's company, the success, and the journey was um, uncharted for a lot of us because we'd lost a lot of cricket matches in the previous two years. For the record, I don't think we have talked about it much on television. This man goes into the Rio Olympic final, and before he does that, 45 minutes or one hour before the final, his Rio sighter breaks down and I have photographs to show for that the table on which he was sitting also broke down mentally suddenly everything's going haywire and you're about to get into an Olympic final how did you cope with that well you accept the situation the fact is the damn things broken and you need to <laughs> find another way to shoot and that's what you try and do you know if you get uh, bogged down by it it's going to just you're going to resist it and it's going to only just take away your resources away and it's just going to uh, your abilities to focus will just diminish so you i just found another site uh, in my bag put that on and try to get on with it that's all what you could what all i could do and that's what i tried to do i mean it broke it broke he shot a 625.2, made the final, was coming second at one point in time, and then when he comes fourth, by what he says, if you, if you actually pull out a hair of yours and try and look at the tip, that tip, if you can see it, then you are perhaps the greatest, you've got the greatest eyesight in the world. None of us can. He lost it by less than that. That's what differentiated Abhinav Bindra from a medal in Rio. And I asked him, are you sad that evening? And he said, look, I've come fourth in the Olympic final. I'm not that bad. That that tells you about a champion athlete, Steve? You've got to admire that. I mean, I, I watch the Olympics a lot and I always feel for the person who's come fourth because they've put so much effort and training and all those years of hard work and sweat and you miss out by, as you say, that's such small margin. But that's, that's the beauty of the Olympics as well, that those small margins mean a lot. I mean, in cricket, it, um, you know, it's not quite as cutthroat. You can sort of get away with making a mistake and you can come back. But um, that's why I admire the Olympic sport so much because it's so cut and dry and... and you know, and that's such a small difference. I mean, swimming, it could be one thousandth of a second, same with the running and the shooting and all these sports. There's such a fine margin of error. So that's why the four years of training and, I guess, practice under pressure that you can perform in that, 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 that moment. But um, the Olympics, I've got to admire all Olympians for that reason. Let's have some fun on the show. Abhinav, I mean, your fourth place story. You've got to say this to my viewers. India and the fourth place. We celebrate our fourth place too much. I mean, you've, he's talked about it for 10 minutes now. He hasn't talked about my gold medal for one, even one minute. <laughs> it was a good fourth place, sir. Question for both of you. I'll start with Abhinav. Uh, Abhinav, when, when you are participating, you've won 180 medals, but you must have lost 1,800 competitions because that's the nature of sport. But is it about perfect preparation? I mean, does an elite athlete propel himself to take him to that zone of equilibrium which you perhaps think is near perfect or perfect two days before i left for beijing from germany and uh, i went on this uh, german commando training course and yeah it was it was to just try and get out of the comfort zone to get the juices flowing to get used to discomfort because in that olympic final it's not going to be some easy task you're going to be nervous and it's it's you're going to be like an infant <laughs> when the, when that pressure is there your mind is going to going to react so everybody's mind is going to react and uh, um, but you have to try and focus focus on the task uh, get used to that feeling it's not comfortable at least it wasn't comfortable for me but uh, you try and make the best of it and try and somehow find uh, in a strange way you have to try and enjoy that discomfort almost and uh, to be able to achieve that pinnacle of success See, I mean, talk about preparation or how you sort of prepared for a major tournament with your team. And the second question is, like what he was talking about in the Olympic final, I'll take you to that semi-final in 99 again. Lance Klusner, best player in the tournament, batting, match almost over, one shot over. What do you tell your boys when uh, the bowler's running into bowl? It's done. I mean, you are cooked, finished, and, and you sort of come back from nowhere. Tell us about that mindset. Well, the truth is, I probably said to Damien Fleming, don't mess it up. <laughs> you know, in those situations, you can't um, overanalyze things. You've just got to trust your natural instincts and, and your practice. And, uh, and just, um, you know, Damien Fleming, in that instance, we had a bit of a chat. It was more about just taking our time, getting the batsman to maybe think we've got some sort of plan. We might not have even had a plan, but it was about 
getting in his mind. And really, I just said to Damien Fleming, look, just try and bowl that Yorker if you can. And when it came out, it was a wide Yorker, so it wasn't the perfect Yorker. And thankfully, um, you know, South Africa cracked under pressure and they played a shot. And the batsmen hadn't talked about what they were going to do. I mean, they still had three or four balls to go. They should have just stayed on that one and waited and back Lance Clues to hit a four because he had every ball in the middle for the whole tournament. So in some situations, you've got to bluff your way through, you know, even if you're not feeling confident. And, and really, in that situation, it was 50-50. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was hoping we were going to do well. But you just give off potty, positive body language, and that's, that's pretty important in that situation. This is the perfect strokes evening. So my last round of perfect questions for both my guests tonight. Steve-O, perfect moment as a sportsman. The perfect moment as a sportsman is watching someone else have that perfect moment. I, I love um, watching people achieve against the odds. I mean, Michael Phelps, 23 gold medals. Um, and so I was lucky enough to be at two Olympics, and I saw every one of his races. I saw every one of Usain Bolt's races, and that was, um, <coughs> I think that's perfection in running, watching him. So I really enjoy seeing other athletes uh, test themselves and overcome adversity and, and, and do these amazing things. So, um, you know, for me, it's about watching other people. But if I had to say, in my own side, um, I think perfection for us was the 99 World Cup at Lords. You know, we, ha we had a plan 18 months before to peak at the right time at Lords in the final. And it all came to fruition. We played the perfect game against Pakistan. We took every catch just at one. Glenn Madra dropped one catch. We bowled amazingly well. We fielded with intensity and purpose. And then we batted. We just blew Pakistan off. And we won the World Cup in 22 overs yeah. against a really good side. So for me, we played the perfect game in the biggest moment, and that's the most satisfying. You've given me the one day, the perfect test match. Um, yeah, look, it's hard. I played 168 test matches, so to put them all, in the catalogue them all, um, for, I guess the perfect test match for us was overcoming the West Indies. In the West Indies, they hadn't been beaten for 15 years. We hadn't beaten them for 22 years as an Australian side. We got the last test match in Jamaica, won all against the great side, but we knew we had an opportunity to beat these guys, and for Mark and myself to both I scored a double century, Mark scored a century. We put on, I think, 200 in the partnership. So it was almost as if we were in the backyard in the western suburbs of Sydney, batting together, listening to the radio, listening to Alan McGillray commentate on a test match. And there, 20 or 30 years later, there we are batting for Australia against the best side in the world. And we beat them on their home turf to then become the world champions. Two questions together. The perfect innings and the perfect wicket, because not always do we talk about Steve or the bowler. I'm glad you did that, because there's a lot of pain and and uh, suffering in my bowling career. But yeah, I think the perfect ball I bowled was, um, was again in the India um, Sri Lanka World Cup of 96 and the semi final. And going around the wicket, and we were desperate for it. I think West Indies about one for 130, chasing only about 200. And um, in my mind, I had getting Brian Lahr out to, with a ball that was sort of angled in and just would deck away and hit the top of off stump. And it was my last ball in my 10th over. And the perfect delivery came out. A pitch sort of middle and took his off stump. And getting Brian Lara out in India on a flat wicket was, for me, was a holy grail. So that was the best ball I ever bowled. Um, sorry, I, 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 I got carried away with that. Now, what was the other part? The perfect innings. Your perfect innings. The perfect innings. So, um, look, I have to say, um, the century in Sydney, you know, against the odds, people were calling from ahead. I was 37 years of age. I believed I still had something to, gi to give for Australia. I was still good enough. But there are a lot of doubters out there. And then to get that four off the last ball, batting with Adam Gilchrist, 40,000 people, um, it was one of those moments where I was sort of cocooned. That I knew there was a lot going on around me, the noise, but you're almost cocooned away from it. I guess it's the same in the Olympic shooting final where you're, sort of, you're aware of something around you, but you're sort of in your own little bubble. And once I hit that four, it was like someone turned the volume up and I could hear all the noise. And it was like, wow, did that really happen? It was, um, it was one of those great moments. If I could give five minutes to my career, it would be come and bat in that last over, hit a four, and then walk off and have the adulation of the crowd. And then for the next 20 minutes, the crowd were clapping outside, and I went out to the balcony about two or three times. It was like I was a rock star giving, you know, giving, you know, going out. And so that was, um, that was a great moment in my career. The perfect cricket ground to play cricket in. Tell me Eden Gardens, 98. We've sure. been harsh with you. We've been I, I love Eden, I you. love Eden Gardens for that memory. That I, I, you know, it's always etched in my memory, the 87 World Cup. 100,000 people cheering for us. And even the test match in 2001, which we lost, I mean, five days where we had 90,000 people, it was like 450,000 people watched the test match, which is un unthinkable now. I mean, every day there was just that, that madness around the ground, that, you know, the chaotic noise that was constant. And when Tendulkar or one of the Indian batsmen were on a roll, it was like I had to use hand signals because no one could hear what I was saying. It was just so loud. So 
to get swept up in that emotion was um, really difficult to handle because you just go along with the crowd and all of a sudden you find yourself rushing. So that was the ultimate challenge for me as a captain was to try and calm things down and keep myself under control. I guess it's a bit like shooting for that gold medal. You had to sort of just take a deep breath, pull back and relax and, and get in the zone. Abhinav, you're not a rapid fire shooter. You're a 10 meter rifle shooter, but this is your rapid fire round. Your perfect moment in shooting. Beijing? Beijing was the perfect outcome. May not have been the perfect performance, but surely the perfect outcome. Perfect performance? Uh, Dortmund, uh, the international competition in Dortmund in 2003, where I shot 599 out of 600 and 105 in the final. And was Rio your perfect preparation? Absolutely. Three final questions. Anything that you want done in this country that will make shooting in this country perfect? Well, I don't know if um, it can be made perfect, but I think what we really need to focus on is the grassroots uh, to set up a foundation for the grassroots, have better coaching structures, uh, empower our domestic coaches to come up to world standards, uh, build an ecosystem around the sport which looks at uh, sporting performance in a holistic manner because today in today's uh, day and age of sport it's not about just shooting and training in the shooting range it's a lot of factors which come into performance at the end of the day at the Olympic Games it's that one percent which which matters and you know that's that one percent of an edge that athletes uh, differentiates gold medals and fourth place finishes. The perfect shot in shooting at 10.9 can you tell me how sort of that happens I mean what what all gets together to get a 10.9? A little bit of luck, for sure. Um, but um, stability, stability of mind, stability of body. And when both come together, when the mind and body are in sync, that's when you get a good shot. Okay, this is a complete random one. Steve has had millions of fans. In cricket, we have millions of fans. Abhinav Bindra's perfect fan. Okay. If it's a woman, so be it. Oh, I have a lot of fans. Uh, I have a lot of fans on Twitter. Tell me one fan who you remember for a tweet or anything. The perfect fan. This is a perfect strokes evening. Don't give me general answers. I have answers. a stalker who keeps calling me and it's quite kind of annoying, but I appreciate her support. Wow. On that note, he loves the stalker. We stalked Steve for all his career. We keep stalking him when he comes to Calcutta. Abhinav will forever be stalked for what he did in Beijing. Win India, that elusive gold medal, the Holy Grail, was touched for the first and only time. And I, I regret having to say the first and only time. But on that note, two legends who've given us enormous memories. What is sport without romance? These two are standout romantic people who've given us these romantic memories for sport. Celebrating them. Royal Stag, Barrel Select, Perfect Strokes Evening. Thank you very much, Steve Waugh. Thank you, Abhinav Bindra. And thanks for watching.